The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified healthcare professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified healthcare provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Sedatives and Analgesics for Intubation by Dr. Robert Pescucci Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Hi, I'm Bob Pescucci. I'm one of the ICU staff here at Children's Hospital Boston. What we're going to talk about today is the drugs that you might consider using in a semi-urgent intubation in the ICU setting. And I'll, I'll give you a sampling of the drugs that we use here. Some of them may or may not be available to you immediately where you are practicing, uh, but most of them are pretty commonly available and they're old, for the most part, they're older drugs that aren't uh, really brand new. Introduction. Let's go on to the main courses. We'll talk about those. Some of those things can be used in smaller doses as appetizers, and we'll come back to those as we go on. Uh, remember that what we're really trying to do here is generate a short general anesthetic, and that means that you need something for sedation or hypnosis, something to put the patient to sleep. You need something for amnesia because you don't want the patient to remember what happened. You need something for analgesia, meaning you're trying to take away the pain associated with the laryngoscopy and the intubation. And then finally, you need muscle relaxation to help the child hold still during the procedure. And, and different combinations of drugs will give you different things. As we go through the drugs, I'll try to point out what does what, uh, and then you sort of make up a package that seems to work for the clinical setting that you're in. And it really is the clinical setting that determines what you want to do because the drugs have different advantages and disadvantages depending on where you're using them. Thiopental. Point of clarification. Thiopental has not been available for use in the United States since around 2011. Uh, let's go over to the middle column here, the main courses, and start at the top. Thiopental, the brand name in the United States is uh, Pentothal, but there may be different brand names elsewhere. Uh, it's a barbiturate. It's a tried and true drug class. It's familiar to most people, and it's very similar to phenobarbital or pentobarbital or any of the other barbiturates that you might consider using. The difference with pentothal between this and, say, phenobarb is time of onset, 60 to 90 seconds, so it's fairly quick, and time of offset, 5 or 10 minutes. So the timing is different with pentothal or thiopentol. And the other thing is the primary effect. The primary effect of phenobarb, for example, would be to control seizures and, oh, by the way, the patient might get sleepy. Here, the primary effect is the, to put the patient to sleep. And if the patient happens to be seizing, you'll probably control those as well. So when would you want to use pentothal specifically? It's particularly good in one circumstance. It's good to control increased intracranial pressure, ICP and it's particularly bad for hemodynamics. And as long as you remember that, I think you'll use pentothal properly. If I have some child who has increased intracranial pressure or suspected increased intracranial pressure, for example, a head trauma patient that comes into the emergency room uh, or someone who has a brain tumor or that sort of setting, then I might specifically want to use a drug that's gonna control the ICP as I put the endotracheal tube in. And in, in my book, Pentothal is probably the best drug, thiopentol is probably the best drug to use that, to do for that. Um, it's bad for hemodynamics, and if you have someone who's marginal in terms of blood pressure, marginal in terms of perfusion, pentothal will make that worse. Uh, so that I think it's good for ICP, bad for hemodynamics, remember those two things. If you have somebody who has increased ICP but their hemodynamics are bad, it would be a mistake to use pentothal because really the hemodynamics take precedence over the ICP control. Now the doses I wrote in here, two to four milligrams per kilogram, are averages and you really have to adjust those to the patient. If I have a very athletic uh, patient, for example, who happens to have a fracture and needs to go to sleep for that, I might be giving four or six milligrams per kilogram of pentothal to get them to sleep. Um, if it's an older woman with a broken hip, 
one per kilo might be enough to put her to sleep and perhaps even make her apneic. So you really have to adjust the dose of thiopental depending on the circumstances that you're using it. Uh, it is just a go to sleep drug. It really doesn't provide amnesia, any amnesia, I'm sorry, and it doesn't provide any analgesia, just to know that. So that's pentothal. Ketamine. Now, ketamine, as the next drug on the list, is used in a variety of clinical settings, is sedation in the emergency room, for example, analgesia, anesthesia for short procedures. What I'm going to do is limit the discussion here just to its use in intubation. And when would you consider using ketamine for an intubation? It's almost in some ways the, the opposite of uh, thiopental. It is not particularly good for ICP. It's good for hemodynamics. And it's good for asthma or reactive airway disease, okay? Now, the not particularly good for ICP part is pretty simple. People used to think that ketamine actually made intracranial pressure go up. I think more recent data suggests that that doesn't necessarily happen as long as you control ventilation, but it isn't particularly beneficial for intracranial pressure control either. So if you have somebody with increased ICP, I would probably avoid ketamine. If you have somebody whose hemodynamics are marginal, ketamine is a good drug. <clears throat> Sorry, because if you administer ketamine to someone, you get an outpouring of endogenous catecholamines. So epinephrine and norepinephrine released from stores tend to go up in the bloodstream, tend to cause some vasoconstriction, and therefore maintain the blood pressure. Uh, so if you have someone, for example, who's hypovolemic, someone who's lost blood volume, and they need to go to the operating room right now, or they need to be intubated right now, ketamine is a drug that you would consider using because it will not make the patient hypotensive. It may even make the patient hypertensive if they have a normal volemic status. And usually that's pretty well tolerated and goes away. So it's good for hemodynamics. It's also good for reactive airways days for asthmatic kids because ketamine tends to be a bronchodilator. And if you give ketamine alone, you can actually use it as a bronchodilator or as a sedative in some intubated child with asthma. But particularly if you're going to intubate somebody with asthma, we like to use ketamine because it will tend to minimize the reactivity that they have when the endotracheal tube is finally in place. So not particularly good for ICP, good for hemodynamics, good for asthma or reactive airway disease. Dosing, <clears throat> one to three per kilo, again, these are average doses. If I were going to intubate someone and use ketamine alone, which is uncommon, but you could do that, I would probably give two to three milligrams per kilogram. You can give the drug intramuscularly, IM, so that if for some reason you lost your IV or you were really in, a, in an urgent sort of setting and you needed to give a drug IM, you could use ketamine and it would work intramuscularly. In those cases, I would tend to give three or even four milligrams per kilogram as a higher dose just to make sure that it gets absorbed. Now, ketamine is one of the drugs on the list that does many things. It's an amnestic because you really don't remember what's happened after you've gotten ketamine. It's a sedative in the sense that it's a dissociative agent so that even though the patient doesn't look like they go to sleep, often they get nystagmus and they don't really seem to be asleep in the classic sense, they really don't remember what's happening. And it's an analgetic so that it's good for pain. It does give some pain relief. So that, that sort of puts it in a little bit of a different category and, and tends to do more than just put you to sleep. It does a variety of other things that you're trying to do at the same time. So it's a nice drug from that point of view. The downside of ketamine is that you can get some dysphoric or unpleasant side effects. And people who've had ketamine for procedures sometimes will describe bad dreams or unpleasant sort of uh, imagery. And, and you can usually get around that by adding some midazolam, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but often giving some midazolam before you give the ketamine is a good idea. Uh, the other thing it will tend to do is increase secretions. It is a sialagogue so that increased secretions might be an issue in terms of intubation. And again, if you've given glycopyrrolate or atropine ahead of time, you can usually block that effect of ketamine, and you might want to consider doing that, particularly if you're going to use ketamine. All right, so that's ketamine. Benzodiazepines and narcotics. Now the next uh, drugs are really combination, and, and I'm saying midazolam and fentanyl, but it could be almost any benzodiazepine and almost any narcotic. These two happen to be relatively fast acting, short duration, and for a short term procedure like intubation, that's probably what you want. Um, <clears throat> you can give full doses, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, or fentanyl is microgram, so it's two to four micrograms per kilogram, and use those as 
<clears throat> is full doses. Or you can do what I frequently do, is make these appetizers instead of main courses so that you give half doses. You get a small amount of midazolam, a small amount of fentanyl while you're getting ready. So if little Johnny is getting ready to be intubated and he doesn't particularly, you know, he's awake, he doesn't particularly like the procedure, you can give him a little bit of midazolam, maybe 0.05 milligrams per kilogram, get a little mask on his face, have him breathe some oxygen. Geez, Johnny, you're doing very well. And give him a little bit of fentanyl, maybe another microgram per kilo instead of two. And you can do this sort of sequentially so that you give a dose of midazolam, a dose of fentanyl, a dose of midazolam, a dose of fentanyl, monitor the child's breathing, monitor the child's blood pressure, get them nicely sedated without really losing protective reflexes, without losing blood pressure, without losing any sort of compensatory response that they've been generating, and just stopping when you think that you've got the result that you want, and then going ahead with the other drugs to put them to sleep and put the tube in. And that way you've gotten some amnesia and some sedation from the midazolam. You've gotten some analgesia from the fentanyl. And that's a nice combination. You can also see what the child looks like before you really put them to sleep so that you'll know that, well, this is, this is how comfortable the child is. So if I put the endotracheal tube in and if I have to put in an arterial line or a central line or something like that after the tube is in, I'll know that I've at least got this level of sedation and analgesia and that it's going to last for typically a half an hour, 45 minutes. So I like to use midazolam and fentanyl as appetizers, as pre-medications for almost anything that I do, any, almost any procedure in the ICU for the good. All right, so that's those drugs. Propofol. Propofol is a newer agent um, and it's quite useful. It's very similar to pentothal in the sense that the time of course is the same. Onset time is about 60 seconds. Offset time is about five or 10 minutes. It has the same profile. It's good for ICP and it's bad for hemodynamics in, in a similar fashion. I personally think that thiopentol is a little bit better than propofol in terms of controlling the ICP, but I, people could certainly argue with that. Um, what's the advantage of propofol? It's really very simple. If I put you to sleep with thiopentol, you're going to go to sleep, you're going to wake up in five or ten minutes, and you're going to feel very groggy, unpleasant. If I put you to sleep with propofol, you're going to go to sleep, you're going to wake up in five or ten minutes, and you're going to feel great. And that is really the difference. You wake up much more clear-headed from propofol than you do from almost any of the other drugs on the list. Now, why would I want that? Well, you know, in, in day surgery settings or in operating room settings, it's a very nice drug to have because people can have outpatient surgery with propofol, wake up, feel great, go home. And it's a little bit of an anti-emetic, which is a plus. In the ICU setting, that may not be such as, uh, so important, but it is important to have someone who you can judge the mental status of. So if someone is a little bit off not quite with it in terms of mental status, but you have to put them to sleep for a procedure and you want them to wake up so that you can evaluate their mental status again, propofol is probably the right drug to use for that. You do have to be careful about blood pressure because it is a hemodynamic uh, suppressant just like pentothal is. All right, so that's propofol. Atomidate. And finally, etomidate is on the list, and, and that tends to be the most hemodynamically protective of all the drugs on the list. If you have someone who really is in marginal condition hemodynamically, you're in kind of a rush to get the tube in. 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of etomidate is a safe way to induce someone. And I think that most people in an ICU practice would feel comfortable using etomidate to intubate someone who is hemodynamically unstable because of all the drugs on the list it is going to maintain hemodynamic stability the best. There are some caveats to using Atomidate. The first is that you can create some clonic activity when you administer the drug. So if there are random arm or extremity motions, it's just a side effect of the drug and it's not a serious one. More importantly though, you can get adrenal suppression from the use of Atomidate. It doesn't seem to be clinically significant with just one dose of Atomidate, but it can be. And certainly multiple doses of Atomidate over a period of time can cause clinical adrenal suppression. Our practice at Children's Hospital in Boston is that we will use Atomidate for somebody who is hemodynamically unstable because we think that in the moment of intubation, it is the safest drug to use. But we are quite aware of the fact that we may be causing adrenal suppression and we watch the patients carefully for that and supply stress dose steroids uh, as soon as we think that they are clinically indicated. 
Some people will even give stress dose steroids if they have given etomidate just to make sure that that doesn't become an issue. Point of clarification. Please note that the American College of Critical Care Medicine 2007 update now states that etomidate is not recommended for children with septic shock unless it is used in a randomized controlled trial format. Lidocaine. I put lidocaine on here. Lidocaine is sort of an adjunct, a condiment to all these things. Um, and it's particularly good for two things. One is control of ICP, and two is wheezing or reactive airways disease. The ICP one is fairly straightforward. If I use lidocaine as sort of a supplement to these things, uh, I can probably get a little bit less of a spike in intracranial pressure with my intubation than I would if I hadn't used lidocaine. So it's a little bit protective in terms of controlling intracranial pressure when you put uh, an endotracheal tube in. Similarly, with reactive airways disease, many people feel that lidocaine is good in terms of suppressing reactivity in airways, so that the asthmatic who's being intubated probably would want to have lidocaine somewhere in the sequence so that maybe you can suppress the reactivity that's going to happen when the endotracheal tube goes into place. So good for ICP, good for reactive airways disease kind of optional, and it's something that I would certainly think of using if I could. The dose is really one milligram per kilogram, but what I'll often do is give a milligram per kilogram back here at, with the appetizers, and then maybe another one per kilo somewhere in the induction sequence. And then if it's taking some time, maybe even a third one per kilo over here just before I put the tube in. And in that way, I've gotten an, a nice dose on board without getting a, a high peak level, which can sometimes be an issue with lidocaine. All right? So, wide combination of drugs, appetizers, main courses, and desserts. Choose what seems to work best for your clinical setting. For example, if it's someone with increased ICP, I'm going to tend to prefer Penethol. If it's someone who's an asthmatic, I'm going to tend to prefer Ketamine. If it's someone who's really cardiovascularly not in good shape, I'm going to tend to prefer Atomidate. If it's someone I want to wake up quickly, I'm going to prefer Profil. There are a variety of things that you have to decide as you're putting together your combination of sedation, amnesia, analgesia, muscle relaxation before you put the tube in. That concludes our video on sedatives and analgesics for intubation. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Feedback is not required to complete this activity in the guided learning pathway.